Good morning. Welcome to Smithville Brethren Church. If you're joining us here in the building or online, we're glad that you're with us either way. Uh, we have a few announcements to make. Uh, first off, the Board of Christian Education is test piloting a program for preschool and elementary students. It's a, a box of material you can pick up and uh, for your children, and then you can watch some videos that we put on on our YouTube channel that will... Uh, be like a Sunday school lesson for your kids and some crafts and some songs that they'll be learning and there's a CD in the box and those kinds of things so something you'll want to check out if you have children of preschool or elementary age kids. Also today is the first Sunday we're going to be going outside for our evening service at 5 30. It will be kind of a repeat of what goes on on Sunday morning. Um, the good news is I hear there's thunderstorms coming because we don't want it to be, we want it to be challenging and, you know, test our ability to do this. So uh, that's happening today. You can pray for us as we get together. I'll have my rain suit on, so it'll be good. And we'll have a good time. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your grace and your mercy in our lives. We're thankful for second chances and third chances and fourth chances and on and on. As we struggle to live for you, uh, Father, help us to continue to return to you and to continue to seek and find your grace. Bless us as we spend our time together that we might learn from you, but more importantly, that we might just experience you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Each week we pick a theme for our worship time together. This morning's is the return of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together and invite each other to worship as we remember Jesus Christ is returning and soon. We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. We believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. With a loud command, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. After that, we who are still alive and are left And so we will be with the Lord forever. If you will, please take your song sheets out or look at the words that are on the screen. We want to sing together, What If It Were Today?
you please be seated if you would take your copy of God's word. Pastor has been preaching through the book of Joshua and we want to turn to Joshua chapter 7. We're going to read in the middle of the story. This the story of Achan's sin. You may recall last week we talked about the Israelites going into Jericho and one of the Israelites by the name of Achan went in and committed sin. We want to begin reading in verse 16. So Joshua chapter 7, and we'll read verses 16 to 21. This is what God's word says. Early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward, and the Zerahites were chosen. He had the clan of the Zerahites come forward by families, and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was chosen. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and honor him. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them, And took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. If you would please join me for a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you that Jesus Christ is coming back and soon. Our prayer is that we would be prepared to meet him. Father, in light of what we have just read, our prayer is that you might cleanse and forgive your people. We too have sinned, whether it is by coveting, whether it is by anger, whether it is bitterness or unforgiveness. Father, we come, we need to be cleansed. We ask that you would not only forgive your people, but that you would purify us. We ask that as we listen to your word being preached, that it would prepare us for obedient service to you. We ask, Father, as well, that we would be faithful in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ so that none of those that we love will ever be able to say they did not hear from us. Let us be faithful in serving as your hands and your feet in this community. And we thank you for this time of preparation But let us never feel that this is the end point. This is the huddle, but we are called to go out and to run the plays when the service is done. We thank you for Jesus Christ who blazed the trail for us. Make us more like him today. In the name of Jesus, amen.
funny thing is it's okay the last thing I need is to be heard but to hear what you would say word of God speak would you pour down like rain washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness word of God speak Finding myself in the midst of you, beyond the music, beyond the noise, all that I need is to be with you. Well done, gentlemen. Well done. Yes. So, I don't know if you like processes or you, you like, like things that say step one, step two, step three. You like to do the Texas two-step. I'm not sure. Uh, I sometimes like processes like that. Uh, you know, you might read an article, five steps to financial security, right? And you think, oh, this is going to be easy. And then you read step one, you realize, I can't buy all the junk I want to buy. And you don't read anymore, right? So then you're not there. Okay, so steps. We're going to talk about steps. I should have called this Steps to Sin by Aiken because he reveals in his confession that Pastor Scott read for us the steps he took. And these are steps not that I want you to follow, okay? Please do not write these down and think, oh, this is, this is the great way to get into sin. No, I want you to think about these steps so that you can reflect on them and stop uh, any, st any point along the road, and that's why we want to talk about these things. There's four steps that uh, Aiken takes, and the first one is Aiken saw things that he wanted. It's just a single word, fill in, saw. Aiken is one of the Israelites that ex has experienced the fall of Jericho. He has been, uh, he's come into the city. He, along with the rest of the nation, has heard that all the valuable things in the city are to be dedicated to God and they are not to be taken for personal use and not to be taken at all. These items will be devoted to the Lord. And so from the beginning, Achan knew there were going to be valuables in the city based on the instruction, right? It would be like going into a house. You say, you know, Grandma always has a cookie jar in the kitchen, kids, but today I don't want you to go to the cookie jar. What have you just told the kids? When you're not looking, go to the kitchen, find the cookie jar, open the cookie jar, 
well, you maybe haven't said all that, but you at least told them the cookies are there, right? In the warning, the valuable things are going to be devoted to the Lord. Nation of Israel, do not take these things. So he was one of those who went in. Israel, we didn't read this. We're going to read this next week and talk about the consequences related to what Achan does. That'll be next week. But Israel suffers a defeat. And so Joshua begins to pray. And what we know is that God tells him someone has sinned. And, and the author of Joshua, Joshua, as, as he's writing out the story, tells us ahead of time who it is. Now, in the, as it's played out, they don't know who it is. God knows. Joshua doesn't know. And so they go through the process of figuring out which tribe and family and so forth, and they make it all the way down to Achan. But let's get to verse 21. Verse 21 says, this is part of uh, Achan's confession, when I saw, it's that simple, when I saw, this is the first step towards sin. Achan saw the things of the city, and it turned out that his eye was caught by several things. A beautiful robe, 20 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold. These would certainly fit into the category of valuable things that were to be devoted to the Lord, right? And he knew that he shouldn't have taken them. And we know as we read the story, not just he knew because God told the whole nation, but we also know he knew because of what he did. His actions reveal his own sense of guilt over what he's done. So the first step, he saw. He laid his eyes on things, and he looked at them. Now, let's get a little clear here, right? So there's no sin in looking at something in some senses. We are not uh, necessarily in charge of everything that we get exposed to. We run across things. We see something. We unintentionally see them. Maybe, maybe uh, he goes into the city not looking for anything in particular, but stumbles across these items. And when he, when he lays eyes on them, then he begins to think about taking hold of them. But he unintentionally sees things. He may have come across them and didn't really realize, stumble on them, whatever you want to say, see, uh, however you want to say that. There is much in our world we cannot help seeing. We're surrounded by things. We're surrounded by people. We're surrounded by the things people have whether we see them on Facebook or in person, if we open our eyes, our eyes will be caught by certain things, people, possessions, experiences, whatever it is. Unless we unplug from life and live in a cabin in the woods off the land, never turning on a TV, never listening to the radio, never engaging in any social media, not interacting with other human beings. Some of you have now gone to that place and thought, that sounds Wonderful, <laughs> right? Sorry, you can come back anytime. Right? Unless you do that, you are going to see things. You're going to experience things. You're going to be confronted with things. That's the nature of living. There's nothing wrong with it. So there's not a sin in, from uh, Aiken's standpoint that he saw something. It gets a little different. But here's the other thing we have to consider. Sometimes we see the things we're looking for, right? Here's the, the, the safe experience you've, many of you have had. You've decided you're going to buy a new vehicle, and you know the make, model, and year of vehicle you're going to buy, and all of a sudden, you see them everywhere. You didn't used to see them, but now you see them. Because why? Because all of a sudden, God has unleashed the world with all these vehicles that are like the one you want? No, they've always been there. You just are now paying attention. And now you see, oh yeah, there's another one, there's another one. I didn't know they had that color. I didn't realize that truck came in periwinkle. It doesn't! Anyway, right? You see them. What are you looking for? Sometimes the problem isn't we stumble across something and see it. Sometimes is we've decided we're going to go looking for it. We're intentionally wanting to expose ourselves to things. We want to get in the place where we can see this or experience this or whatever. And so... We are responsible. It is a sin to go looking for sin. It is a sin to go to places you know you will be tempted. It is not the unintentional stumbling across that I'm talking about. It is the 
I'm going to go find it. It is the children going to grandma's and you say the cookies are in the cookie jar but we're not going to have cookies and the children go waltzing into the kitchen and maybe in their minds they're going to say to themselves, I stumbled across the cookie jar, mom. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You went looking for it. We don't know from the story whether Achan, when he heard the warning, or when he thought about what it meant to take the city, if he began to imagine the kind of amazing things that he might come across that he could gather up and take for himself. We don't know that. We don't know if he stumbled across things. We don't know if he went looking for them. But I want us to consider that sometimes we put ourselves in all kinds of areas of temptation because that's exactly what we're trying to do. We don't have an intention to avoid sin. We have an intention to find it. And so the first step is seeing. Some of our greatest struggles in our lives have to do with what we're not avoiding. We should ask ourselves, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? What am I exposing myself to intentionally? What am I giving my time and my effort and my mental energy to? And is it what God desires of me in whatever area you want to discuss? So, step one on the pathway to sin, Achan saw. The second step is this. It's the word covet or coveted. He coveted it. After Achan saw the things that drew his attention, which, you know, might have been different things for different people, but for Achan it was these things. When he saw them, he coveted them. Uh, One writer puts puts it this way. Coveting describes the desire for that which one has no right to possess. It's the thing I want, but I know... I have no right to have. It's a thing I want to get a hold of, whatever it is. But there's no legitimate way for me to have that. You can think about all the various things that would fall into that category. Achan wants these things. He has no right to them. Uh, God has already commanded that these things will not be taken. So Achan cannot put these on his Christmas list. He can't say to his wife, for my birthday... I want that robe and those 200 shekels of silver and that cool wedge of gold. They're off limits. They're out of bounds. There's no way that he can have them, but he wants them. God has called these things devoted things, meaning that they are to be given to him and not anyone else. These are items that will be in possession by God alone and not by other people. Achan has to be uh, able to see these things, admire them, and then walk away. Wow, that's an amazing robe. That's a very nice pile of money. That's a neat piece of chunk of gold. Off to the category and into the collection of devoted things to God they go. Instead, he covets them. When I say that, what I'm talking about is, this is an active verb. He's choosing to do something. He's seen these things, And we don't know, intentionally or unintentionally, but he's gotten to that point, he's seen them, but then what does he do in his mind? What he does in his mind is he begins to think about them. We might think that our thoughts just happen. We might think that our thoughts are 100% triggered from the outside world. I saw these things and I, I just couldn't stop thinking about them. But when we say things like that, we're taking ourselves off the hook as though our thoughts are outside of our control, as though our thoughts are someone else's responsibility, but they are not. Achan sees these things and decides he's going to think about how to get them, how to possess them. He's going to think about what it would be like to have these items. And he is responsible for what's going on in his own mind. We are the gatekeepers of our minds. The Bible says we should take every thought captive to Christ we're not off the hook things thoughts don't just come into our mind and we get to say oh we have to deal with them Achan likes what he sees and moves 
into other thoughts, right? Think about this. He, <laughs> thoughts begin maybe to roll in his mind like words like, I want it. I want it. He's thinking about the item. He's interested in it. He looks at them and he desires them and he allows that desire to grow in his mind. Or, or he goes to another step and he says, you know, it's cold. I need that robe. How often do we use that one? I need it. Because if you need it, you can't not have it, right? right? I mean, that's, that's how it works. That's how we excuse ourselves. So it's not something I want. It's something I need. And then we add to the list of things that we need all manner of things. And we can convince ourselves with that cute little word need that we have to have whatever it is we want. We will justify whatever it is. I can't possibly deny myself. It's a need. So just think for a moment. The person at the end of a 5K road race who's been running the whole time could legitimately say at the end, I need a Porsche 99, 944 convertible. No. Water, right? Food. I've been to a bunch of these races. I'll say it, but you know it. Always as a spectator. And I've watched these people cross the finish line. I don't know why they started across the start line, but anyway, they cross the finish line and they look three quarters dead. I know along the way they hand out water, but at the end they look three quarters dead. And then, in the one race that I've been to a number of times, then they let them go in the, in the, in the building and they give them like Subway sandwiches and they just <laughs> load them up with food. It may be the reason some of them are crossing the line. I don't know. But you know what? Those people need Subway. I do not. Those people need water. Watching the race does not cause me to be very thirsty. Right? But we say about things, I need. Well, let's think about another phrase we let go in our mind. Because coveting is an act of our mind. Right? So we have to monitor our thoughts. I want it. That's fairly, fairly straightforward. I need it. How about, I deserve it. I deserve it. I've worked so hard, I deserve, fill in the blank, doesn't matter what it is. It's been a long week, it's been a long month, it's been a long year, it's been a long life. <laughs> I deserve it. So again, I don't have to then, it is my way of justifying what I've done. Did Aiken say to himself, eh, we've marched around this city six days in a row, and on the seventh day we marched around seven times, I deserve this stuff. I don't know. He doesn't tell us that. But sometimes that's what's going on in our minds. And when coveting is full-blown, we sort of leave the I deserve, I need, I want, and our minds go to a place of I can't imagine life without, where we've really convinced ourselves for whatever of the reasons we want to do, the mental gymnastics we do to make it all sound right and good and holy and whatever, we finally get there and say, I just can't imagine not having it. And so we're on the verge of acting. Do you know that the scriptures are clear that we've already sinned? Right? We know that coveting is a sin. It's somewhere in a list of, I don't know, 10 things that we aren't supposed to be involved in, right? We've already done something that is sinful, but now we're going to act in another way often, right? Now, just pause for a moment. As I've laid these out, did you notice that I was using I each time? I want, I need, I deserve, I can't imagine. Because coveting is often very selfish. It's all about me. I got to have it. I got to have it. I need it. I deserve it. It's like Eve in the garden, David in his palace. Coveting is about what I want. Whether it's right or wrong, it doesn't matter. Whether it's beneficial to others, it doesn't matter. It's all about me. God says, don't take these things, but I like them, I want them, I deserve them, I need them, and so I will. Coveting is a sin, folks. Left unconfessed, it will lead to more sin, which is step three. Very simple. In his confession, I saw it, I wanted it, I took it. I took it. It's the logical outcome for what's going on in his mind. When people are coveting things, when people are desiring things and coming up with ways in order to justify getting whatever it is they want, and they're not auditing their thoughts, they eventually will act. In this case, 
Achan has been thinking. Has he been thinking a long time? We don't know. Did he plot this out as soon as he found out we were going to take Jericho and thought to himself, there's going to be great stuff. I can't wait. I, well, what will I stumble upon? It'll be awesome. I'm going to bring like a burlap sack with me so I can open it up and stuff things in and hide it. I'm going to wear a big overcoat. I don't know. Did he plot it? Did he plan it? Did he stumble across it? We don't know. Did he think about how much he wanted it for an extended period of time? Did he circle back to the place he found the things? Or as soon as he saw them, did he know, I'm taking those babies. We, we don't know how long it went. Sometimes for us, it's an immediate, whoa, I'm going to take And the I want, and the I'm going to covet it, and the I take it all happens very rapidly. And for other times, it is a slow fade. It's a debate. It's a struggle in our minds. It's, I know I shouldn't do this, but... I know I should, but I don't. So for Achan, he follows through and takes it. He grabs the thing. He grabs them. He takes them. Now, there's no legitimate way for him to ever have these things, even though he's attracted to them. God had already said, no, they're out of bounds, but he wants them nonetheless and decides to act on his desire and just take them. So he's taking what doesn't belong to him. It's theft. This taking often does harm to others. Now, next week we'll talk about the battle that gets lost and all of that, and then the consequences that spill over, not just to him, but to his whole family uh, as part of that. But the taking often does harm to others. Sin harms others, not just ourselves, but the taking also diminishes the taker. The taking diminishes the taker. When we give in to the sinful thoughts of our lives, and decide to act on them, we are diminishing ourselves. Achan is a thief. He's stolen from God, and the impact spreads out on the entire nation. Now, what's the fourth step in Achan's sin? He hides the things he's taken. Remember what I said? We knew that he knew not to do this. And one of the reasons we know is because we know from Joshua that God had already told the nation of Israel, don't take these things. These are going to be devoted things. You are not to take them. But we also know that Achan personally knows, because you might say, well, maybe Achan wasn't in on that meeting. Maybe his Zoom connection failed or the, the video sputtered a little bit at that moment or whatever. We know he knows not to take them because of what he did with them. He did not pick them up and say to his fellow Israelites, dude, look at this robe. Look how well it fits. These shekels of silver fit right in these huge pockets, and I can hold this wedge of gold. No, what does it say he does to them? He hides them. He digs a hole and sticks them in the ground. Why? Because that's a safe place to keep your valuables? Just a little quick survey. How many of you have clothing stored for the future in a hole in the ground? It's biblical. <laughs> He hides them because he knows he's guilty of sin. He hides them because he knows he's done wrong. He probably knew he was doing wrong in, along the way, because often that's how it is for us, right? Aiken's no different than us. We know along the way our thoughts are heading in a place that is not going to end well, that is not going to end up in a good spot or a good place, but we do it anyway. He takes them and he hides them. What good is it to bury a robe and valuable things in the ground? Why would you bother to do that? Because he's trying to conceal his sin. Is he hopeful that at some point people will forget about it and he can pull them out later and show them off? Look at this pile of silver. Isn't this a nice robe that I have? Is he hopeful that he'll feel good that he has these things kind of tucked away where nobody knows about them? Achan is hiding him from his fellow Israelites. And he appears to be successful because in the chapter, there's the moving through the people, the clans and the families to figure out who has the stuff. And no one else fesses up for him. Right? So it seems like he got these things away and buried them without anyone else knowing. So he's good at hiding. He's good at concealing. Good at keeping a secret. And so he made it to the point of no one else knows. Oh, wait a minute. Can't really say it that way, can we? Because God always knows. 
right? What's the principle here? You can hide your stuff from all kinds of people. You can bury your stuff in the ground. You can hide who you really are. You can hide all kinds of things from everyone you know. Harder to hide it from the people closest to you, but by golly, there are people who do a great job of it. I've met them. I was recently having a conversation with a friend, and I said, uh, they said to me about a third person we know, I cannot believe that that person did that. I never in a million years would have guessed they would have done that. Now, the person I'm talking to is not unintelligent or unobservant, but the person they're talking about worked really hard to conceal what they were up to. Right? Because that's the nature of sin. Most of us don't sin and then broadcast it. Right? I mean, some people do for sure, but most of us don't, right? We want to hide it. It's a natural response to the guilt we feel about what we have done. Please remember, people can be fooled by our appearances. People can be taken in by the great uh, image we portray, but God is never fooled by that. If you look online and you uh, are interested in these kinds of things, you can read all kinds of amazing stories of people who embezzled money, people who lived, <laughs> this one I just don't, I don't get this one at all, but not that I get embezzling, but I get it to some degree that what people are up to, like people who have two families at the same time, like I can't keep up with one of them. How could you have two in two different locations? And how expensive would that, maybe you have to embezzle in order to have two families in two locations. But you read about these crazy stories and these elaborate schemes people uh, engage in in order to hide what they are doing because they know what they are doing is not what God desires. We naturally hide. We want to maintain our reputation. We want people to think good things of us. We live with a great amount of stress in our lives when we're trying to keep up appearances. We work constantly at making sure no one will find out because we don't want to get caught. So let's go to a safer example for a moment. Uh, when we are driving our vehicles down the road and we drive the speed limit wherever we are under all circumstances, we never have to worry about getting pulled over for speeding, do we? Right? We, you know, most of us don't drive around thinking, that radar gun is probably off by five miles an hour and it's gonna get pull, I'm going to get pulled over because they've, they've got it wrong. No. What we worry about is, I always drive whatever your number is. I personally enjoy these numbers. Well, if you drive five and a half miles an hour over the speed limit, you won't get pulled over. Oh, right? Sure. Yeah, well, we'll see how that goes. Well, I think it's anything under nine. If you're over 55, I mean speed limit, you can go nine over and still not get pulled over. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Here's how speed limits work, folks. If you go 56, you can get pulled over, right, in a 55, because it's called a speed limit, which means once you get, when you go around, anyway, you got the point, right? So when you drive the speed limit, you don't have to worry about getting caught, right? There are a couple places on Hutton Road that the State Highway Patrol hides. They hide so they can catch me. So when I'm driving to the church office, to read my Bible, and I should get here soon, they're trying to catch me. But the sneaky thing is, there's nothing to catch, because I drive by and wave, because I'm going the speed limit. I don't have to worry about it, right? Aiken is working hard to hide this stuff, because he knows he shouldn't have it. And he knows he shouldn't have it, because he feels guilty, he's understood the command of God, he knows what's going on in the nation, and he shouldn't possess it at all. People can spend a lot of time wondering, am I going to get caught? Right? Is my wife going to find out about my other wife? <laughs> right? Is my employer going to find out about what I've done? Are the people close to me going to find out what I've been doing in my spare time? And it destroys us from the inside out. Remember, if you will, the story of David and Bathsheba, and you could take these four steps and drop it right onto that story. He saw, he coveted, he took, and he hid. He saw her from the balcony, decided he wanted her, 
thought about that, coveted, right? Got his, his officials to go find her and get her and bring her. He took her. Right? And then he tried really hard to hide what he had done. She sends word, I'm pregnant. He sends word to the husband. Get the husband back off the front lines and get him home so that we can cover up what we've done. But that doesn't work because the husband has more integrity than the king, which is always a fascinating part of the story, and doesn't comply with what the king wants. So he tries again, applies him with some alcohol. That doesn't work. So he hides the sin by having the husband killed. And he involves some other people in it. Hey, get him up to the front line. Then when things get a little hot and heavy on the battlefield, back up and let him get... And in that story as well, does he hide the whole thing from God? No. no, no. And are there consequences that spread? Yes, absolutely. In this process, step one in the progression is about what Achan saw. That's the first place we should stop and ask ourselves, what am I looking for? It's the first place to cut this thing off before it goes any further. And if we find ourselves mulling over the I want, I need, I deserve, I can't imagine without, even though I know that's illegitimate, we can cut those thoughts off as well. Confess them because they're sin. And if we've made it to the place of taking what we should not take, we can confess. And if we've made it to the place of taking what we should not take and we've hidden and we're concealing and hiding and holding secrets, we can confess. Because God will forgive us. And next week we'll talk about some of the consequences that come. But God is a forgiving God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you desire us not to live the way Achan lived in this particular uh, little piece of his life. We don't know anything really about the rest of his life. We just have this one account where he made a series of bad choices that were sinful. Help us, Father, as we find ourselves moving on from step one, or even in step one, intentionally looking Help us, Father, to to turn away, that we might honor you with all of who we are and live without fear of people finding out. Amen. This past Friday, Wendy, Ian, and I headed off to Worcester High School to get Ian registered for his senior year of classes. It is something else going back to the high school that you graduated from. Not the same building, by the way, because I'm old enough that I graduated back when it was Cornerstone Elementary was the high school. But just going back to being a high school student, I have a lot of memories from back then, but this morning as Pastor was preaching, I couldn't help but think of the experience I had in a science class one day. I remember sitting in the class, the teacher told us that they had to step out for a few minutes, And as soon as the teacher stepped out, the class went wild. I'm here to tell you the Bunsen burners came out and people were making popcorn. Folks got out the rubbing alcohol. They were pouring it on the desktops and lighting it on fire. The papers were flying. The paper airplanes were going. People were standing on chairs. It was a party until the teacher walked back in. Then all of a sudden, a lot of the happiness was not so happy. There were folks that were prepared for the teacher, me and maybe one other. (laughs) There were a lot of folks that weren't ready. In our country today, we have a lot of folks not ready for the return of Jesus Christ. We have people in the community not ready for Jesus to come back. Maybe there are people in your family, in your home, maybe even in your mirror. But Jesus is coming back. For those that are prepared, it will be a wonderful day. For those that are not, it will be too late. I invite you to take your sheet of paper. Let's stand together. Or look at the words on the screen. Jesus is coming again. A reminder for those of us when we're ready, it will be a glorious day.
Father, may we be ready for event, your eventual return through Christ in every way. Help us to live our lives as holy followers of yours. In Jesus' name, amen.